Here we go. Oh, oh there he is. is. What an absolute legend. We are joined by Ryan Caldwell. What an absolute legend. What a wonderful moment for us. Ex Irish International, of course, but now running an incredible um, health holistic getaway in Belfast, which we're going to come on to shortly. But firstly, congratulations, Ryan, because I know you've recently had a baby, and so is Archie. So, yeah. what's it like being a being a father? Great. It's really great. Um, not much sleep getting done right now, but it's worth it. It's so worth it. Like, we she just started smiling, so that's amazing. For like at last, you know, it was amazing. Yeah. Is your, is, is your daughter smiling yet? Um, she she does smile sometimes. Um, you know when I when I put the rugby on, uh, because uh, I don't know how much you know, Ryan. I'm the CEO of Clapham here. Um, the chief chat officer. I'm a semi pro rugby player work in the city. Um, Good. and uh, yeah, how old's your daughter? She is seven weeks, eight weeks on Wednesday. Wow. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I'm a little bit ahead of you. Uh, but yeah, the, the smiling is is a wonderful part of fatherhood. Um, so yeah, what's your daughter called? Rhea. Rhea so my first okay. name's Rhea, second name's Sunshine. Oh, oh nice. lovely. Nice. <laughs> my daughter's called Johnny Jono Haskell Abandonon uh, Curzon. Class, beautiful. <laughs> Well, Ryan, obviously you've got an incredible story to tell, but but let's go back quickly to the start of your journey, where you were sort of a schoolboy prodigy um, and you captained your school to the Ulster Cup in 2003. Archie was obviously obsessed with uh, rugby at school, still is, but he also loved the you know distractions you get as a teenage boy, the girls, the cheekers, what, you know, whatever, the partying. But is it right to say that you were somewhat sort of hypnotised by rugby? You were sort of overly obsessed. Yeah, I would say that, like, looking back now, definitely, you know, I my, my life was just sort of, I was so focused on rugby at that stage. Um, So there was a lot, like, I didn't go to my school formal. Like, yeah. my school was sort of leavers thing because I had, uh, I was playing rugby the next day and, like, I would have stayed away from girls and stuff like that because I thought, but they were like just distracting me away from from rugby. Like I was very much focused on the sport at that time. What? Why? The what? We went to as well was very much rugby oriented. You know, it was almost like a professional atmosphere, a professional setup when you were in school. And was it, why? Why were you so obsessed, Ryan? Was that from from the school itself, or did no? You I just precious? really loved rugby. Like rugby was my yeah, absolute right. first love. You know what I mean? I absolutely. Just love playing rugby. Well, fair play. I still bloody love playing it. I play semi-professional clap every week. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's like a it's like a small orgasm. You know those things at school <laughs> when they put the hand on your knees and eighth of an orgasm. That's what I feel when I step on the rugby pitch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ryan, obviously your dream did come true because when you left school, you signed to join Ulster on a de- development contract. You know, thirty-five yeah. grand plus you know good money to fucking be on a d- development contract um just tell yeah. us your memories of walking into the club because obviously you were joining ulster when there were some big names some big characters around uh what was it like joining the team and sort of living the dream initially uh having left school yeah like it all happened really fast you know so like it was sort of when I remember getting the phone call to come and see the, the CEO of Ulster with the development or the academy coach at the time. And I didn't really didn't really know what it was going to be about. And then I went in, they were, we're going to offer you a development contract. And I was like, whoa, like, I couldn't believe it. You know, and then, um, so it was amazing. Like, it was like, yes, my dreams were coming true. And it was, it was when we, when I first started to train with Ulster, it was, Alan Solomons, I was doing a few training sessions and he was still coaching and there was like some big names still playing with Ulster back then. So it was, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was an amazing time. We, we, we had Stevie Ferris on recently on the podcast. Were, were you there oh, yeah. at the time he was there? Yeah, yeah. I know Stevie well, actually. Yeah. He's a good guy. Good, good guy. Good, good on the night out. Stevie, yeah, really good. Good guy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Top guy, yeah. Um, was it like an initiation when you uh got your first cat for Ulster or not? Initiation? Um, I don't know. I can't really remember. I, th- I remember just getting. Re- I think we all went out and everyone got really, really drunk. I think everyone <laughs> buys you a drink. Oh uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Classic, and, we love uh, that. Like most things, rugby's initiations that involved a lot of alcohol, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, when you look back at your Ulster days, I mean, obviously it was a wonderful period for you. You got to live your dream, playing in your sort of hometown, all that stuff. But you were plagued with injuries, weren't you? Your, your hip started to give in at a very early age, yeah. I think, sort of 22. Can you tell us, like, obviously us not being professionals, well, you, you think you are, but you're not. Well, you're Semi-pray. not. Um, yeah. but, but can you tell us the sort of the medication injections you used to have to sort of undergo on a daily basis to just to get out on the pitch and, and sort of what effect that had on you mentally and physically? Yeah, I think the first, from the first few years of my career, was was great. Like I was pretty much injury free, and then it was actually on the Churchill Cup. Uh, it was in England, and uh, it was actually during a training session. I had somebody had just bumped my knee, and it had really twinged my hip, and that was the start of my hip issues. And to play that match, they gave me like a suppository <laughs> painkiller to, to play the next day. Yeah. And I was like, this is a massive tablet to swallow. And they were like, no, no, you don't swallow that one. And I was like, all right. <laughs> so uh, that, that was... Uh, I, I, went, I went to boarding school, Colders, and that was, my, that was the only way my head of, um, head of dorm used to give me my medicine. <laughs> so it's, it's the way I prefer it now. If there, any oh, way, yeah. if there's, there's one way I take medicine, it's up my rectum. I do, I, I enjoy the feeling. It just depends what the medication is because sometimes I need help from my next door neighbor, Albert. He's a 70 year old man, but uh, yeah, no. Carry on, carry on. It's just a great way to take medicine. So, uh, that was like that was the start of the hip injuries, and then from around twenty two, they just got progressively worse, um, to the point where I was um, I was getting a lot of cortisone injections and taking a lot of anti-inflammatories and painkillers, and that sort of got increased towards the end of my career, um, where I had went to a guy called Richard Villers in. He's one of the top hip guys in London, and he did like a scan and stuff, and and I think he actually did a bit of a, a keyhole thing, and he when we finished that, he had said like he goes, I have no idea how you're playing rugby or have been playing rugby at all because these are the worst hips I've ever seen. Wow. You know, it was just getting through it. I think when you're playing, it's like you manage you like. If you look at my start of my career towards the end, like my whole running game had changed. The way I played was changed. You know, I wasn't jackling for ball anymore. I wasn't really getting around the pitch as well as I would have at the start of my career. Um, but yeah, it was just poorly managed, I think, by me. Obviously, like players just want to go out onto the pitch, but I think sometimes it could have been managed a wee bit better in the early days. What, uh, uh, were, were you addicted to the the painkillers? I, I did uh, end up being addicted to painkillers. Uh, yeah. Is that? I mean, I know it's a silly question. How does that happen? But does that happen without really you realizing it as such? Um, or do you yeah. know that you're doing it? Or does that sort? Of, is it a slow sort it's of? It's like a slow. Yeah. It was like a slow burner. It was like a slow process. But I think. During my career, I can look back and say, yeah, I think I was addicted to the painkillers. Um, and even sometimes I would have got like sleeping tablets and stuff after matches. Uh, I think the sort of, I, think, I don't know why, I think I was sort of going through maybe towards the end of the career, I'd lost the joy in rugby sort of thing. And then it was, and then after rugby had finished, the, I, the the hip problems kept going and it kept on. That's whenever the the painkillers start really, the addiction really started was when the rugby career finished or when I noticed it start to mo- more. You know, nice, nice. Um, obviously before the injuries really took over your career and became a massive, massive problem, you were doing incredibly well and <laughs> you got called up to train with the Ireland squad in two thousand and seven, pushing for a place uh, in that camp. But obviously that camp turned out to be one of the most famous stories in all rugby circles. Yeah. Uh, when Paul O'Connell, for some reason, had a training ground bust up with you, but it was more than a bust up. Uh, he knocked you unconscious. Things got rapidly worse from there. Can, can you tell us your memories of that incident and sort of how bad things got, how the punch came about, and then the immediate aftermath? 
Yeah, well, my own memories of it are very, very limited because yeah, I didn't, I don't remember anything after, and I, I, I had sort of went on what other people had said uh, that had happened. You know, like uh, people who were Ulster players on the, who were there, and when I had got back, they had sort of explained what had happened, and it was we were doing training, uh, and it was. From what I can remember, it was grab. But when when it's grab and stuff like the the at that level, like tackles are like you do do hits, you know. And uh, I think we were. I think it might even have been full contact. I'm not sure to be honest, but there was something that happened. I had tackled Polly and then ended up on top of him or and pushed off him or I'm not sure, but. I had annoyed him in some way, and then I think it was just I wasn't actually there. wasn't a fight as such. It was just a, a punch, and uh, yeah, I got knocked out. And uh, I think I got woken up, but I had to be like resuscitated on the ground. I had gone into like a seizure on the floor and like blood stuff like that. And like um, when I had come around. I had no idea like where I was at all. Like and I they had said uh I was lying there and the doctor at the time who was Mick, Mick O'Driscoll was uh he was like, Do you know where you are? And I was like, Look right, I was like playing rugby. And he goes, Where? And I, I don't know. And he goes, You're with the Ireland team and I was like, The proper Ireland team, the full <laughs> Ireland team. And he was like, Yeah, and I was like, No way. <laughs> you couldn't believe it. I was like, I've done it. You know, but so, uh, but yeah, and then I had gone, I spent the night in the hospital, you know, and like Polly had come up, he came up that night and like we spoke about it and he, he apologized, he was actually emotional about it. Like, I mean, I have no hard feelings towards Paul O'Connell, you know, and I hate, I hate whenever we're like, because sometimes I'm given a different what the what's been put in books and stuff, you know. But I remember at the time, like the Ireland, the 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 manager, Paul had come up and he was like, "Don't talk about this, like you know, don't talk about this to anyone." And like, what happened, you know? Well, just don't talk about it and stuff. And of course, at that age, I'm trying to get onto the Ireland setup. I'm like, "No, definitely won't. Don't worry about it," you know. So they were obviously worried, like they knew that it wasn't a a, a training ground bust up, you know. Do you, th- do you think it's obviously been made quite uh, a, a story now, but obviously for a lot of our listeners, it is quite a regular thing that happens in rugby clubs, international people scrap, right? It's because people are scrapping for places you want to show passion, right? So it's yeah, it's not an, it's not like an a, a abnormal abnormal thing to happen, right? And I think people think it is, but it's no. not. And I think it was just you know if it had been different than you know, but I think it was just I wasn't expecting the punch and. Mm-hmm. Um, I got knocked out, but if it maybe had it been like if Polly had it pushed me or and I had it turned around, we probably would have had a punch up, you know. Yeah. But it was but, just a bit. I don't know. I don't know. I just wait, and I, wait, I don't like really talking about it much, as if I'm trying to put like a different side over. But yeah. I'm just trying to put what I remembered as being. That's what I remember. Cold is just two things. We've got a lot of young, uh, younger listeners. Uh, one tip for all of those guys out there. If you do want to punch someone, do it when they're not expecting it. You'll get great, uh, great success. And second of, <laughs> second of all, it actually, you know, I work in the city. Sometimes I have scraps of people in my office. You know? Yeah, yeah, because it's competitive. Yeah. And, you know, I've yeah. I, I, I thrown, I thrown some, some punches. Well, yeah. I mean, I missed. Yeah, I've got. Uh, it doesn't matter. I've, I've seen okay. you box. So I'm not surprised up. by that. I put my fist. When I put my yeah. fist up, they know yeah. business, or or I've got a deal. They don't. Yeah, know. it's but, either I've got a deal, or I'm pissed off. We're gonna have a scrap. But but <laughs> Ryan, Paul O'Connell thought he'd killed you, didn't he? Because you 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 had to have your shirt cut off by the doctor. You had to be resuscitated for three minutes. You were bleeding yeah. out from your mouth quite dramatically. I mean, he was terrified that he'd killed you. Um, but do yeah. you feel nowadays, now you're retired, and now obviously you've lived a couple of lives. Um. Do you feel in hindsight rugby players have to pretend to be too macho day to day? Like, is there this false kind of macho macho stuff goes on, which creates a weird vibe? Yeah, I do. I think it's like <clears throat> not maybe not saying every single player, but I do think there's like an underlying sort of it's an alpha male culture, isn't it? You know, 
at rug rugby players, you know. Um and like sort of I think it can be a wee bit a wee bit toxic at times, you know. And that's from being on the inside of it at times. You know, and not only that, I think it puts a lot of pressure on people to keep up this sort of facade or uh, you know, I, I don't wanna talk about things and you know, um and can't really mean the whole thing with society at the minute is men are find it hard to express like what's actually going on in here. And that's why a lot of men are struggling, you know, because when they get around their friends that don't really want to be vulnerable like that. And the same the same in rugby circles. I mean, I think in rugby circles it's even sometimes magnified because you've got like 30 guys who think they're alpha males. And like, you know. Colders, do you, do you think like looking back on it now, and obviously you know you have got a a distinct look compared to what you used to do when you played rugby, but you obviously seem very comfortable in yourself. Yeah. And maybe there was elements in your earlier career where you probably weren't comfortable, and you totally, know that yeah. le that led to uh, erratic, sometimes erratic behavior or reputation that then then you kind of felt like you had to abstain. Do you think if yeah. you played rugby nowadays and you were allowed to express yourself as you are doing now? Uh, do yeah. you think you would have had a better career because you are more at peace totally. with yourself? Yeah. Totally. Like, yeah, yeah. Because I think, yeah, like sometimes I look back, I think the, the, the person like I was then, and I'm like, it was a constant, like, it was a constant mask I was wearing, you know? Um, and it was like, I think, I got that reputation and then I had to like live up to it then, you know. And I sort of not saying that I had to, I probably enjoyed some of it, you know, and like enjoyed part of that thing. But now I'm like, no, I look back and I'm, I think if I had I actually said to someone the other day, because this whole thing started for me with psychedelics, I went and drank ayahuasca uh, or, and, yeah. and, 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 and similar. Seven of I've, I've had psilocybin, uh, magic mushrooms, and I, I said to someone the other day, I was like, "Gosh, I actually wish I had had magic mushrooms when I was playing rugby, <laughs> <laughs> because I think it would have been so much better." Well, oh. Ryan, <laughs> a couple of years after that famous scrap, you did obviously sign for Bath, which is Archie's yeah. Archie's favorite club. Uh, a beautiful town, obviously a nice, nice change of pace from from Belfast, I can imagine. Uh, but you shared a house with a friend of the show of ours in Carl Ferns. Uh, what was he like to live with? Yes, uh, a hard nosed scouser. Yeah. What, what do you remember yes. of time with him? Uh, me and Carl actually, when we first went, when I first went over to Bath, Carl was the first guy I met because we were both staying at Farley House, which were Bath was where we were training there yeah. at that time. So we were staying and. We were like together in Farley House for the first like couple of weeks, and like uh, yeah, I actually really got on with Carl. I, I really had a lot of time for him, um, and uh, we actually had a couple of nights out. Actually, we went to Liverpool once for a night out. I can't really remember much about it. We just <laughs> it was a a, a wild night, and. Uh, yeah, and then, yeah, I used to, we lived with each other for a while, and we used to go out drinking for a while. I remember, I remember he had a bit of a temper. Yeah. Much like myself <laughs> back then. What, what, um, what did... I remember the Gavin Henson incident. Yeah. yeah. I was after a massive long day of drinking at a Thatcher Cider Farm. <laughs> it's like, Super it was, Gav. Uh, yeah. Super Gav. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> super gav. Because Fernsey told a good story about when you guys lived in, uh, is it the bungalow he was doing up? And you went to you went to the pub for a, for I think, a beer. Oh, it was a we ended, up, we ended up scrapping outside the pub. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I remember that. How so did we, that come uh, about? I think we were just so drunk and we were playing pool, I think. I think we were playing pool against two other guys. And like something happened, and I had bought a whiskey, and Carl was like, "Where's my whiskey?" or something. And I was like, "Hang on, I'm gonna get you one." And then he was like, still mouthing off at me, and then I brought the whiskey down, and like 
it was like, here you go, bro, and just went like that, <laughs> like throughout the space. And like, <laughs> I was laughing, it was a joke, you know. But because uh, I thought I was so drunk, I thought it was hilarious. The car was absolutely raging. He's like, let's go outside. And I was like, let's go. And we both just went outside. And then the police actually came and was like, what are you guys doing? Like, you know, there was like people, the whole pub ended up on the street to watch us fight. Oh my God. And then we were like dancing around each other for a while, threw a couple of punches. He actually caught me just above my eye. Jesus. I remember because I went to the room the next day with a bit of a shiner. <laughs> and uh, and the police dropped us home. <laughs> it's like, it's going to be all right. We just both went into the two different bedrooms. <laughs> Oh it was quite yeah, funny. It was brilliant. Well, obviously, you had a great time at Bath. Did you ever play with Nick Abendon when he was down there? Archie's supposed yeah, to be the best player. Yeah. 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 Bender's good guy. Good guy. Speaks yeah. very highly of Ryan. Yeah. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's an he's a absolute legend. For a long time for Nick. Well, Ryan, obviously, a couple of good years at Bath, but then injuries keep <laughs> on crawling up on you and probably even getting worse. And then you escape the town life, the beautiful uh, Roman town, into the countryside, into Devon, and you sign for Exeter. Albeit, obviously, still struggling with his injuries. Um, but you were enjoying your rugby, weren't you? That, that, that was sort of Ulster towards the end and Bath was a bit of a struggle on the pitch. But I read that extra days, your last couple of years, you were sort of happy with your rugby until you had that meeting with the doctor who gave you the most shocking yeah. news you could ever imagine in your early 30s. What was that news? What did he say? Just that he <clears throat> wasn't advising me to go and play rugby again. He said he couldn't send me automatically to go back on the pitch. And is that and, because of the concussions? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because of the concussion. So, um, yeah, and that was just a lot to take at that stage for it to be happening so quickly. Um, it was a shock at that time. But I had been enjoying my rugby at Exeter. Like, Exeter was an amazing club. And I'm really glad I went there. And, Especially the first the first year at Exeter, I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed playing at that club, and uh, the coaches at that club are some of the best I ever played for. Just that man managing people, and you know, it's you feel like you can really approach those coaches at Exeter, which was great. Well, can you tell us oh, yeah. sort of the sort of negative effects of? multiple concussions obviously you experienced quite a few in a, in a short period of time we've heard from other players about how you just you know all have different reactions to it but they're all quite debilitating and, and, and terrifying what was your sort of do, do you remember any scary days after a concussion um like to be honest uh my memory really suffered a lot from from the concussions and still my memory still really bad um so I'm, I have to write a lot of things down, leave myself reminders for things. And for a long time, it really affected my mood. I found myself really overly aggressive and depressed um, and really sort of lost. Um, didn't really have much direction, you know. So it, it, was, it was a lot at that stage. Definitely a lot of people around me noticed that it really affected my mood. It really affected my... I was quite aggressive. Well, obviously, we, well, we we do a lot of work with the RPA now, who over the last couple of years have really stepped up their game in giving uh, support to ex-players. But I know four or five years ago, as you said earlier, people didn't know enough about the mental health and, and the support needed to you know help ex-players. Um, but... You returned to Northern Ireland, as you just said, they're lost, slightly depressed, anxious. you just been had your career cut short. You thought you had five more years left in the game, at least. You returned to Northern Ireland with your remaining money you've saved throughout your career, throughout your playing days. But then you quickly fell into a sort of a hole of alcohol and drugs dependency. How did that spiral so quickly from arriving back on the Northern Irish shores? Well, there was... Um, I think at that stage, I... When I got home, it was like the big thing I'd, I'd lost. I had a, quite a big loss of identity, like, and I feel like that's where a lot of the issues sort of stem from was that loss of who I was, you know. Because then I came home and it was like I was trying to keep up a facade of, you know, having some money and, you know, and I really had nothing at that stage. 
um, and just I used to worry about what people would think. You know, oh, there's that guy who used to play for Ulster. Like, look at him now. Or, What's he doing now? And it used to it used to it used to be all about what other people thought about me, um, and I think that really keep put me under a lot of like perceived pressure. And then I think it was all false. Like I used I was going out, and I was, I got fell in with a group of fellas, and I, I think everyone at that stage there was a lot of cocaine around. Every any to anywhere you went. At the, even in Belfast or anywhere over in England, like if you go to a club, there's people with cocaine. And I had used cocaine before, like, but it got had got into a, a, it's this started to get into a bit of a problem because it was just going to the stage where I would be having to get cocaine before I did something, before I went somewhere. And then it was just okay, taking cocaine before I went out to meet people for lunch and then it was going to the gym. I was even taking cocaine sometimes. And then on the other side of that, I was again still taking painkillers. So it was like and diazepam, things like that. So it was like uppers and, and diners is what they call, you know, cocaine and then you're taking these other things. Um, and sleeping tablets and things like that. So and I think it was just all to do with this sort of, it was all stemming from here, like how I was feeling in myself, no confidence and depressed and, you know, so that's how it started. That's how things snowballed, if you like. I, I imagine, obviously, you know, you weren't, well, you didn't have a sort of direct income, but buying that much cocaine out in Belfast you must have been quickly broke. I mean, what what was your sort of flat like? Could you afford to pay your bills? Did you give up on your living conditions? Were you putting your drug habit in front of your think, livelihood? Well, for a while, I was living in, like, the high-rise flats and that. And there was times, like, you know, when I was unemployed and I had no money, like, my money had run out. And I was there. And there, was, there was nights where I had no electric, no gas, you know. And I would just go to bed, you know, and there was other times, you know, and I used to say to myself then, like, that was just the low times, you know, that I was in. Um, and I used to think back then, like, God, like, how have things got like this and stuff, you know, but I suppose it can happen to anyone. And I think going through all that, like, really, now, like, I used to, I used to judge people, you know, I used to see people and who were on drugs in the street or addicts and, you know, and I used to be like, whoa, like, you know, and, and judge them a bit. <laughs> now, I just, there's not that. I just, just take all that away from me, like, because actually, it can happen to anybody, you know. Completely. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned mixing with the wrong crowds. You did start mixing the wrong crowd in, in, in Ireland, and you know, in your own words, and you, you became sort of a dealer and enforcer in, in Belfast. I mean, what were those days like um, for you now looking back on them? I mean, obviously at the time they were a bit of a, a, a whirlwind, but what was it like now when you could sort of remember the day-to-day -day antics of dealing and enforcing and gang warfare? Well, <clears throat> I mean... Obviously, I look back and I'm and I'm not proud of it. Like I look back and I'm like, whoa, you know. But I feel like the way I look at life now is I, I don't I couldn't I know that everything that's brought me to where I'm at had is just the way it all happened. Like we can't change any of it. And then when I when I think about it that way, it's sort of okay. I understand that there's so many more factors than just myself. In those in that situation, so there was the crowds I was running around with, and what I was doing to myself. I was, you know, putting myself in these situations. I was taking these drugs that were altering my perception of what was going on and what I was doing. You know, and like it was, I was borderline. Like I was, I was a completely different person. Like it's, it's hard for me to relate to that now. But uh, I know what happened, and like again, I don't look back at myself with like shame, or I just look back with understanding and be like, 
you know, almost like understanding what happened to myself there, you know. Because I think when we look back at things and beat ourselves up, it's like, it's detrimental to your growth. We're just going to get stuck there. You know? I've read that you, uh, <laughs> you kept on being arrested by the same copper who, who, who kept on giving you a chance. It, it sounded like a nice guy, knew who you were and, you know, kept on willing you to change. Um, but you did end up in prison on uh, on two occasions. Um, can you give us an insight into sort of how terrifying prison life was? I mean, obviously you're six foot seven, you, you you're you're a big guy, but but what was it like making the move from the darkness on the streets to the darkness in the jail? You you could ask me that, Freddie, because I went to boarding school from the age of seven to eighteen. So <laughs> similar similar uh, yeah. probably, similar experiences, but you you go, Colton. This is this is your podcast, not mine. <laughs> so. Um, well, I think, yeah, prison was not, I wasn't there for long, but I was, I was there and I was there for long enough, you know, and, uh, it was, uh, a massive shock to my system and like, very hard, very hard, you know, because I had, you know, achieved, you know, I was, I've done, like, played rugby at high level and that, and then again, just when I got to, 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 to jail or to prison, I was like, in the cell, I was like, how has this happened? You know, it was like a massive, just the worst, you know, if I was thinking about my parents and my family and, all this, all these people, and I just was find it very, very difficult, and you know, and that's whenever I actually tried to uh, take my life. That the first night we were in, we were in prison, so sort of, um, that was a massive turning point, I guess. You know, being resuscitated and found, and then you know, given being it's still here, you know, it was massive. Do you, do you think do you think prison brings out kind of obviously the worst in people, but for yourself as well because you're such a uh, a big guy. There is like there's an element where you have to again put a facade on in such an area where it is just males, or is there an element because uh, most people who listen to this podcast wouldn't have been to jail, uh, but I imagine that if you did go to jail, then you your biggest fear is being taken advantage of, or you know very much like in a ru- rugby club environment yeah. you want to be an alpha male or did is that completely opposite did you manage to become more t- in terms of yourself or were you trying to put on a facade that you were hard but underneath petrified no like to be honest i just really just tried to well after that after that happened on the first night they did they, they put you in this like it's like a cell with like a big it's a window and then you don't really get out as much, you know, it's like more they'll bring food over or something because they've got you on like a, a watch, you know, they don't want you to do anything. So, but it was like the second time uh, I was out in the yard and stuff more, I was really trying to keep myself to myself. Um, and obviously you talk to a few people, but no, it wasn't really as much like, you know, people trying to, be the alpha male or anything. Yeah. yeah. It was the way that their prison worked was this be all the new arrivals would go onto these two wings or these two landings. And then oh, they would all mingle together. So it was mostly all people on remand and people waiting mm-hmm. to go up the cells or who had just arrived. They were, you know, sentenced. So it wasn't really like they are, you weren't really around like the established guys in the jail who would be like you know running landings and stuff. All right, sounds like a summer camp. My dad sent me on. Um, <laughs> We, 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 we've interviewed a couple of guys who've been to Bel- Belmarsh in London, which is an old Victorian prison, you know, still very backwards. Um, I'm guessing he told us that drugs were pretty easily available in prison. It, was that the case in, in Ireland? And also, what were the living conditions like? Well, the cells are tiny and the doors are so small. So, like, I have to, like, walk through the doors and, like, the amount of times I bang my head 
on the door after being concussed. Like there was one day I was like, oh gosh, like you know, but um the living conditions, you know, just really basic. It's an old prison as well. Like McGavery's not it's it's pretty old parts of it. Um and then uh Sorry, what was the rest of that question? Sorry. Oh, to, to, <laughs> just drugs, like in prison. Obviously. Oh, drugs, yeah. Like, so the whole thing, so <clears throat> they would give you your tablets and stuff, okay, like every day in the morning. So if you were getting, you would get a daily dispense of tablets. Um, and then some people would hold on to their, do you remember to take them in front of the nurse? And some people would like pretend to take them and then spit them back out and then be able to trade those for other drugs or you can you can get heroin in the jail no problem um i was offered heroin before i, I didn't take it obviously i didn't take it but oh, uh, uh, yeah yeah um but at that stage i was taking my tablets what about that stuff they can smoke which completely sort oh, of spice spice debilitates you no we didn't really have any of that i think that's more in england i think Fair play. well obviously you had the most horrifying you know a lot about drugs well i've interviewed a lot of people <laughs> yeah. in prison <laughs> um you obviously had that horrible experience on that first night and i read that you accounted it down to a warden and a guard fortuitously walking past your cell at the right time yeah. to save your life is that is that correct yeah that's right so he said afterwards, he was like, I never, ever walked down that corridor at that time. But he said he just he just went over to the cell and opened it and seen, seen me. And uh, that was it. That's what he, that was that. And uh, you were in the boys' cell? Yeah, this was my own cell. Well, post-prison, you then decided to change your life. And, and that was sparked by a trip, as you mentioned earlier, to Colombia for six weeks. Uh, can you tell us of your experiences there and how their rituals and their practices helped you see the world for what it is, but also turn your life around in the greatest way possible? Um, so I had went to a, a place in Ireland to drink ayahuasca, and I think it was at the end of August. Um, and it was good, but I knew that there was something else, you know, so... I heard about ayahuasca and the Joe Rogan and what everyone was saying on Joe Rogan experience was like more than what I had experienced in 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 that in, in the circle in Ireland, the ayahuasca circle. So they were going to Colombia, these people. So they had all booked on. Like they had, there was people from that uh that group that were going out to Colombia. But I booked on so late, so my flight was like by myself, and I did like the whole journey like on my own. Eh? It was like just perfect that way, you know, because it's so many times. Like when I went down, I was about to go on the bus in Belfast. I was like the bus to Dublin. The flight was Dublin to Paris to Bogota, and then um, a fourteen-hour bus journey from Bogota to Puerto Mayo. Yeah. Yeah. In the very, very bottom of Colombia, and then more journeys to where we were drinking our ayahuasca. Um, and it was like, it was amazing. Um, it was, I think it was just perfect to do it myself that way, you know. Then I met those guys when I got there, you know, and we, it was, uh, we drank ayahuasca, which is like a psychedelic brew. Um, and it's very, very strong. And I think doing it out there in the, in, in the Amazon is like way, way more powerful. And we actually drank, we had different shamans come and give us different ayahuasca over the course we were there. We were there like five or six weeks. And we went there and they drank the ayahuasca. And before going out, was I was still struggling with a lot of addiction. So a lot of tablets. Um, still cocaine but not as much but then once once i went there like whatever happened during those experiences with ayahuasca like came home and i just never touched it never touched it again C Codis, when, when, you, when, 
so sorry to interrupt, what? but when you when you go there, it, it am I right in saying that you have to abstain from salt? You know, master. Yeah, they, they, they so, give you a diet. Yeah. They give yeah, you yeah. a diet the day, you yeah, know, yeah. before you drink, because it just the way that it actually really can affect how the medicine affects you, and that's what it is. It's medicine. That's what ayahuasca is. Ron, I mean, obviously, everyone wants to know what happens. Everyone has a different trip. Everyone has a different experience. But obviously, we read a lot about people being sick to get rid of their sort of darkness, their their darkened soul. Can you just tell us what happens? What what, what happened to you? What you know, physically and and sort of uh, you know, emotionally. So, I think that that that's so hard to put the actual like the journeys in the words, like these psychedelic experiences. It's like. It's very hard to put them into our English 2D language, you know, because they're such amazing experiences. But I think in the jungle, I had a lot of a sense of forgiveness. And the, the, these entities would come to me on the ayahuasca and they would tell me that it was okay, like everything's okay and you're going to be okay. You know, but you've got to change. I, I had to change. And it's like, just let you see that what you need to do. And they actually can show you and like you feel your potential. But then it's like, this is up to you. You have to do it. Like we can help you, but you have to do it. You know, and that's what it was. It was a real realization of no one else can can get you out of where you are apart from yourself. Like it's good to have support around you, but ultimately it's you, you know. And and, and, and and physically? Well, one of the nights, one of my hips dislocated in the, in, in, in the jungle. Uh, it was the second night we were there drinking ayahuasca. And I was, um, I went up and I asked for, you know, mass, one more, one more cup. And the woman, it was a female tayata, like a female healer. And she was, uh, she said, uno mas, okay, one more. And I went, I drank it. And then the way it works, it makes you purge. So I went over in the circle and I went over to the trees. And I was like being sick, but I was down on my hunkers. And I was like th throwing up. And uh, the, 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 the trip started to really intensify. And uh, I, put my hands on my knees to like push my push myself up the standard and my knee just like went inwards and my hip dislocated. This was the hip, one of the hips that had been replaced. Mm. And it dislocated and I was like going into a full psychedelic journey and I was like, oh my gosh, what's happened? And it was again, why is this happening? Like, why has this happened now? Yeah. You know? But, um, so... We got it sort of out. We got the hip back back in. I had to actually go. They, we had to get carried up to the road, to this road, and then get like a van to take me to this oh tiny little like sort of hospital. Um, were, you which tripping? Like, were you tripping? Yeah, I was, oh. yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. Like yeah. completely, I was like, whoa, this is, I, I kept forgetting that my hip was dislocated. I was like, where are we going? Like, <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, we're going to get your hip fixed. Oh my god! Well, obviously that experience completely changed your life, and then you come back to Ireland, as you said there, you managed to give up all your addictions down and up. But um, you now run your own business called Inner Evolution. Can you tell us what you do, and also how our listeners can get involved? I know it's out in Ireland, but we do have quite a quite a big strong relationship out there. Yeah, definitely. So, <clears throat> Inner Evolution uh, was came about. Um, over about a year and a half ago or just over a year and a half ago and um, so I kept on I've been doing a lot of the, the, the ayahuasca and the, the psychedelic journeys opened me to a whole different way of living and it opened a real like I've had so many uh, unbelievable experiences with these with these medicines that they've actually sparked like a change in how I've lived over the last few years um, and so I started to have daily practices of meditation and 
breath work, um, changing my diet, um, what I'm eating, because uh, it, it was really affecting my mood as well. And just starting to do more things in life that I really enjoyed, and about nature, things like that. And so I started to feel like these are things that everybody should be doing. Um, and have access to. So I actually serve Campbell medicine, which is uh, a frog medicine from the Amazon. And this is actually my treatment room we're in. We frog. <laughs> so, and uh, Campbell is like a origin of medicine. So it makes you sick for around 15 minutes. But it's not just a physical cleanse, it's a, an energy cleanse. So, the, uh, the body's made way more than just uh, skin and bone and, and tissue. You carry around a lot of energy in, in your body. You know, energy from uh, traumas that we've been to, through in the past or times where we've felt low. And that can leave us, that can like almost be like a hangover from the trauma, it can like, make us feel depressed now or have a limited view on life now. And that's just energy in our body. So, Cambo is a great way to like, let release some of that energy from the body. And people who come for Cambo feel like lighter, more focused, more energy, you know, and just opens up again and a new chapter for them to start doing their own work. How long does it so last? The, the Cambo, the whole ceremony really lasts around one and a half hours, but you know, we, we we have to prepare the person as well, you know, and uh, we do a couple of things beforehand. We do a wee bit of breath work just to get them really centred in themselves. Um, and then we apply the medicine and the medicine stays on their body for around 15, 20 minutes. And the results are really, really amazing. Um, and... Have you There's done a lot of, of, so, Sorry to interrupt. Have you done any of your old teammates yet or not? No, not yet. Not yet. I've done, uh, there's been a few sports guys that have been coming in. Like, you know, uh, there's a few Moto, uh, Moto GP people have been in, the, the super bikes. Yeah. Um, and they find it really good for their reactions and their focus and, you know, things like this. So, that is one of the things I do, and I also run retreats, which is um, we do lots of breath work, cold water therapy, things like this, uh, meditation, um, and it's just a really about showing people how to do these things and how to put them into their life so that they can start to take responsibility for their, for here. Well, Ron, we are going to put the link for your website in the podcast notes and yeah. obviously promote it on our Instagram. You've Fa been fascinating an chat. Yeah, yeah. Thank incredible. you so much for your time. Yes. We really appreciate it. We're just going to finish in the traditional way we always Thank do, you. where we read out 10 of your previous teammates and you simply tell us if they were good guys or not by saying if they had chat or no chat. So let's start off with Carl, <laughs> Carl Burns. Chat or no chat? Chat. Paul O'Connell. Chat. <laughs> <laughs> Nicky Benderman. Oh, chat. Ollie Barkley. Chat. Brian O'Driscoll. No chat. Ronan O'Gara. No chat. Matt Banahan. Chat. Henry Slade. Chat. Rory Best. Chat. And Peter Stringer. Hmm. Sorry, strings, no chat, no chat. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, you've been Ryan, absolutely you incredible, mate. Much. Honestly, that's the most wonderful podcast we've yeah, done. Yeah. Thank you thank so, you so much for your time, mate. So interesting. Listen, Good luck with everything. So much. Thank mate, you so much. Thank you so much. We'll link everything up and and get our uh, our listeners coming your way. And I'm sure Archie's interested as well. Yeah, yeah I'll come. I'll yeah. come and do it. Cool. Look forward to seeing you. Yeah, thank you so much, Ryan. Speak to you soon, mate. Appreciate Cheers. It.